Thank you very much. My name is Will Hayward. I'm the, the VP of uh, Europe at BuzzFeed. Um, I'm going to take you through a little bit of the history of BuzzFeed and how we think about content, uh, how we think about the web, and how we work with brands. Um, so, uh, I don't know how many of you saw, there was some big press recently. Uh, we took a round of investment from a, a very big tech venture capital company called Andreessen Horowitz. Um, they're one of the early stage investors in Facebook and Twitter and all these big companies. Um, and there was a big hoo-ha about it saying, what are Andreessen Horowitz doing investing in a media company? Um, and uh, we had the sort of the eyes of the world on, I think we've had the eyes of the world on us for a while actually, but, but they were even more kind of focused on us. Um, uh, so there's a lot of hype around BuzzFeed at the moment. Um, uh, we are uh, currently, I was talking to some people from Comscore last week, arguably the biggest news and entertainment website in the world now. So we've got over 150 million uniques globally. Um, and the most interesting thing really about our sort of stats are that 75% of our traffic comes from social. So most media companies um, get the vast majority of their traffic from people directly visiting their site. We get the vast majority of our traffic because people share our content. So we're all about publishing content that people want to share. Um, uh, another big announcement that we made was that we're actually splitting off our video wing as well. So we, we acquired a video company about two years ago. And uh, in a relatively short period of time, we're now, uh, we, I put here 250 million plus monthly views. We actually last month passed 400 million monthly views. And believe it or not, we're now uh, actively thinking about how we can take that a step further and maybe start creating uh, series and um, films and all these sorts of things. We've got some very big ambitions in video. Um, and my last boasting slide, um, uh, we launched the UK office about 12 months ago and we're, uh, we're over 13 million uniques in the UK now, which puts us in the top 10 news and entertainment websites. So uh, I thought I'd give some context to where we are. I've done all my boasting. Um, uh, how on earth did this site that most people in the UK still know of as the cat site end up uh, with such huge scale and all this interest and all this attention? Um, so our founder is a guy called Jonah Peretti. Uh, in 2001, Jonah was procrastinating whilst writing his master's thesis uh, and uh, came across this thing that Nike were doing called the Nike ID site, um, where you could go on and you could amend the trainer and you could make it whatever color you wanted it to be and you could put your name or a nickname on the back of the shoe. Um, Jonah being uh, very smart and also a bit of a troublemaker um, asked if he could have sweatshop written on the side of the trainer. Um, and somewhat surprisingly, Nike didn't want to do that. Uh, somewhat stupidly, and I can say this in a room full of comms people, they made the mistake of responding and they wrote back and said, dear Mr. Peretti, uh, we would love to give you the trainers with sweatshop written on them, uh, but sweatshop is uh, slang and uh, we can't put slang on our trainers. And he wrote back and said, actually, it's not slang, it's in the dictionary. Uh, it means a factory uh, where people toil in inhumane conditions. Um, please, could I have my trainers? Um, and they kind of bounced a few more emails back and forth. And the one they eventually ended up ignoring was him saying, that's fine, I don't want the trainers anymore. Can I just have a photo of the 12 year old uh, uh, sort of Southeast Asian girl stitching uh, the trainers together, please? Um, and they ignored him. Um, now look, we all know that kind of uh, the, the first rule of comms is stay away from troublemakers. Uh, they didn't, um, and what he did is then forwarded this email on to 10 friends. They forwarded it on to 10 more friends, and two weeks later, Jonah was on um, CNN being interviewed by Katie Couric about why he was trying to take Nike out globally um, uh, and what was his sort of agenda. Uh, another week later, he was uh, on Fox uh, being assured by Nike's global head of communications that they were taking the matter very seriously and they were going to shut down all their sweatshop production houses uh, and all these things. Um, uh, uh, Jonah from there sort of decided to get more and more interested in why people share things and what's the motivation, why do people choose to pass things on. Um, his next silly little thing was uh, the rejection line. So he and his sister set up this thing where uh, people uh, could take this phone number and give it to people who approached them in bars to chat them up and say, of course I'd love to speak to you again, uh, Mr. Drunk Man, um, uh, here's my number. And then people would go home and phone the number and it would say, uh, I'm very sorry, this person doesn't want to see you again. Uh, press one to listen to some heartfelt poetry. Uh, press two to cling on to the idea that you uh, might still be, in this person might still be interested in you. Um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And that did very well, and then he ended up on um, CNN again, being asked about why human beings are so lonely and why we can't say how we feel and all these sorts of things. Um, 
And Jonah then went on to kind of uh, think about media and tech a lot more and all those things. I went on to set up a small site called the Huffington Post, uh, which uh, did very well. Um, and he kind of wandered off uh, to think about those sorts of things. Simultaneously, uh, the guy who now runs our video studio, a guy called Zay Frank, uh, in exactly the same year was hosting a party in the West Coast. And uh, I think I can say this, Zay's a slightly odd fellow. Uh, uh, until he was a very successful internet uh, entrepreneur, people probably didn't want to hang out with him too much. So he had to do fun things to get people to come to his party. He set up a HTML site, How to Dance Properly, um, where you could kind of click these different buttons and Zay would illustrate how you should do that dance. Um, so being an American, no offense to the Americans, um, uh, there's obviously Stir the Pot of Love, uh, which is sexy. Um, and then as a father of a recently born child, this is the only dance I can now do, uh, which is the hanging out casual dance. Um, and a month later, so he had the party, lots of people came, it was great, it was a wonderful success. Uh, and then about a month later, his internet hosting company phoned him up and said that he owned them, owed them $40,000 for uh, hosting fees because over a million people had been looking at this content and sharing it and passing it around. Uh, sim oh yes, and he set up a game as well. So. Uh, hold on, I'll remind. Um, he set up a game called the Game of Life. Now, I'm not of, excuse me, God, uh, the religious persuasion. So I have to, it never even occurred to me that I'll be presenting this here. Um, but uh, in the Game of Life, you can select your faith denomination. My personal faith denomination, sorry God, is uh, atheist. So this is what happens when I play uh, uh, the, oh no, hold on, not that one. Two secs. This is what happens. Okay, we'll just get the Buddhist. Okay, so this is what happens when you play the, the game of life as the Buddhist. Um, uh, you play the game, you die, and you're a chicken. Um, I'm sorry, the atheist one's much better because it just says game over, you die. Uh, that's it. Uh, but anyway, maybe. What a surprise, it didn't work. Um, uh, so... Um, uh, anyway, and meanwhile, so the final sort of the final of the, the big trio is a guy called Ben Smith. Um, simultaneously, Ben Smith was in New York trying to break big stories and uh, not having much success because he didn't work for a very, very big newspaper or anything like that. And he realized if he could hack his BlackBerry together in a way that would allow him to post content directly from his BlackBerry to his blog, he could suddenly start scooping the other 20 reporters who were in the room trying to think about serious news. Uh, and he went on and had incredible success and, and became a very big journalist in the US, uh, purely from this realization that with breaking news, the most important thing is getting it out before anyone else. So those were sort of three, three of the original figures behind BuzzFeed. The original sort of thought behind BuzzFeed, uh, and I know that uh, especially the H&K people here uh, all work really hard and uh, never look at Facebook or anything like that during their, um, their, their downtime, uh, but believe it or not, there is a global audience of people who are bored at work. And uh, we felt if we could create really shareable, enjoyable content uh, that had some sort of reason to share, into it, share in it, so identity or humor or... Uh, in information or something like that, we could build a very big media company in a comparatively short period of time. Um, which means that, as most people here would know, we started with the very funny stuff. So we did funny posts like uh, 34 gifts that sum up your first sexual experience. Now, sorry Jesus, again. Uh, the funnest thing about this is trying to guess what gender the person was who submitted the gif. Um, so uh, have a wild stab in the dark, bad choice of... Uh, language, uh, um, about the gender of the person who submitted this. Uh, so that was someone's uh, first sexual experience. Um, once again, I suggest this is probably from a lady again, so this is another person submitted this as their first sexual experience. Uh, so there you go. Um, this next one is kind of interesting because thematically, arguably, it could be a man. But then if you look at what's happening, maybe it's a, a, a lady. Uh, is anyone here an Arsenal fan? There you go. Okay. So um, first sexual experience. <laughs> and then just kind of giving up. Um, uh, the next one I just is repulsive, so sorry. Uh, but I think it's probably a man again. Um, uh, so there you go. <laughs> Um, and then the final one, who knows where it came from, uh, but here you go. Um, so those are all sort of, uh, like I said, gifts that summarize your first experience. So BuzzFeed started with this idea of kind of collating, uh, collating funny stuff around the web and building identity into it. Um, and, 
And we had wonderful success with that. And we built massive scale in a relatively short period of time. And then we thought, uh, I should probably get rid of that. Um, then we thought, great, we can build scale with funny stuff, but people don't just look at funny stuff in their downtime, they also look at serious stuff. So why can't we use some of the things that we've learned about the web um, uh, to start looking at proper news, start looking at breaking events, start looking at analysis. Could we start covering things like that? And we hired the guy I mentioned before, Ben Smith, um, and we started filing uh, long-form reporting and serious news from all over the world. Uh, about a month ago, we filed this report from Liberia, so everyone knows what's going on in Liberia at the moment with the Ebola outbreak. Uh, what some of you might not know is that lots of people in Liberia actually think that Ebola is um, sort of a conspiracy and it's a way of controlling the local population, and there have been a couple of awful instance of local people going into Ebola hospitals and smashing up the equipment and throwing everyone out and saying, look, this is all made up. Um, and we were one of the very, very few news outlets to have anyone who was brave enough to go to Liberia and actually cover the story. Uh, we also not only scooped where the MH17 bodies were, um, but uh, have got this incredible guy called Max Seddon, who's in, he's actually in the Ukraine now rather than Russia. Um, but uh, he was using his, our knowledge and like looking at social media and trying to break stories from social media. So this was a Russian soldier who was uh, driving a tank uh, who was bored and he was posting these Instagram photos and he wasn't realizing that the photos were all geotagged and it actually showed that he was in, in, in the Ukraine. Um, uh, so we, we kind of scooped that, which was big news. It all got picked up by the New York Times and the BBC and all those sorts of things. Um, and then in the UK, we're investing very heavily in polit political news, uh, and we're not shying away from the serious sort of stories about the duplicitous nature of our government, um, uh, uh, with conclusive proof that George Osborne is actually Bob the Builder. Uh, George Osborne is never, ever seen in public without a hard hat, um, uh, which is great. Like I said, we're investing in video a lot as well. Um, so... Uh, we don't just want to do video, we want to do video with a reason that someone would share it. So we think about identity. Um, as I think I've already said, I recently had a child. Uh, uh, when I sort of told people I was having a kid, a couple of people from BuzzFeed sent me this video, and then as it got closer and closer to due date, more and more people sent me this video, and it started to feel like a threat, and it was less and less funny. Um, uh, but here is a video about having kids. <laughs> Were you throwing stuff over the side? So uh, the way these things are supposed to go is that I kind of stand up here and I make some big statement at the beginning uh, and then I sort of take you on this journey and then I prove the point and, and you all sort of cheer and clap. Um, rather than doing that, I thought I'd be slightly more buzzfeedy and just provide you with a series of things that we think about uh, and we kind of talk about internally within the company. So uh, one of the first things we talk about is how the internet has changed. So uh, there is an excellent book that I recommend everyone read it's called The Shallows by a guy called Nicholas Carr. And in The Shallows, he documents kind of the history of media and how the internet is changing the way we think. And one of the things he says is that whenever there's a new media platform, the first thing that it does is allow us to do the thing we were doing previously slightly better. And then it kind of transforms into this new thing. So when radio came out, uh, the first thing that radio did is allow people to kind of read newspapers on air. Uh, and then kind of radio shows came out and, and it became this whole new thing. And when TV first came out, TV was kind of modeled on radio. Uh, people just stood there and they talked, but then this whole new thing happened and TV shows came about and this whole new media landscape evolved. And at BuzzFeed, we think that the first stage of the internet has really been all about doing the thing we were doing previously slightly better. So the first era of the web 
uh, is all about these big online destinations, much like newspapers or potentially TV channels, these big sort of AOLs, Yahoo's, which were just kind of full of content, um, but just kind of sat there on the web full of things you could choose to look at. And I think in marketing and communications, quite often we behave like that. We just create these destinations, put them somewhere, and then presume people are gonna go and look at them or pay sort of money for, through search to get people to look at them. Um, the second stage of the web was uh, really all about search. So in the early 2000s, obviously, the quantity of content online just exploded, and there was so much stuff to look at that just being a destination wasn't good enough anymore. And for consumers, uh, it was hard to work out what you wanted to look at. And uh, famously, Google built this massive company about organizing the world's information, organizing all this information online, and then making it easily accessible. Um, and the result was these sort of new media companies evolved. So uh, companies like about.com, which were essentially SEO companies. They just built content purely to respond well to what people were searching for. And it was kind of an interesting chapter of uh, media history, but not very good content. This isn't content built for human beings. This is content built for algorithms. We now think we're in the third stage of the web, the, uh, the age of social. So. Um, when social first came about, when Facebook came about, when MySpace, Twitter, all these different sites, um, they were sites really. They were just part of the media landscape. They were kind of destinations. And now we think of social really as being a layer across the whole of the web. So social is a thing that kind of flows across the whole of um, content online. Uh, in terms of proving that to you, um, this is something from, uh, we have a thing called the BuzzFeed Partner Network, so we promote other publishers' content on our site. These are big publishers, news and entertainment companies, and uh, in return, we have tracking cookies on their sites, and we can look where their referral traffic is coming from. Now, if you look, uh, we only set this up at the end of 2011. Uh, by the beginning of 2012, referral sites to news organizations from Facebook was already about the same as Google. So the people who'd run out and hired an SEO company in the early 2000s had already run out and hired a social, social, uh, social team and realized getting people to share their content was really important. And for much of 2012, uh, sort of search and social battled out as being the primary driver of content online. And then in 2013, search started to overtake. And then at the end of 2013, Facebook famously tweaked their uh, Facebook algorithm, their so homepage, their newsfeed algorithm to massively reward content online and suddenly the most important thing that any media company was doing was thinking how they can get people to share their content uh, which sort of connects with my next point which is destinations aren't really what they used to be so um, uh, there were two big reports that came out in the last three or four months so one you paid for which is the uh, 2022 towards 500 million report commissioned by a guy called Lord Stringer from the BBC and the other was the New York Times innovation report an internal document looking at their business and both of these reports lament the fact that as news organizations they have totally failed to realize that they are operating in a different reality that the reality today is people don't wake up and look at their phone and look at news sites or entertainment sites people wake up and they look at Facebook they look at Twitter they look at all these social networks and they see what people are talking about and what they're sharing and they need to do a much better job of working in this new reality. This is homepage traffic to the New York Times from their own data. Uh, and you can see that in the two years between 2011 and 2013, um, homepage traffic more than halved. People weren't going to the New York Times in the way they used to. They were finding pieces of New York Times content, sharing it with their friends, and then friends were coming in sideways rather than going to it as a destination. Uh, just a comparison point, this is how we think about data at BuzzFeed. So the blue stuff is direct traffic. This is people treating us like a sort of an old school destination. And the red stuff is um, uh, uh, social referral traffic. So people coming to us because they found our content on Facebook and Twitter. And this is what we're really well known for, creating content that, that spreads out from BuzzFeed, that gets passed around Facebook, passed around Twitter, um, and all those sorts of sites. Uh, now, very much like Simon said, uh, somewhat frustratingly, uh, uh, media has changed. Um, just as Simon said, there used to be this fallacy in marketing and communications that uh, the person who reads The Economist is fundamentally different from the person who reads Grazia. Um, these two people are entirely different and we should have entirely different communication strategies. Actually, um, they're the same person. Like you can be, there are plenty of people in this room who would read both these titles in the same day. Um, uh, so, uh, apparently this bit's been spoiled by Candice. Uh, but we think of publishing as being like the Paris Cafe. Um, you can sit in a Paris Cafe, 
uh, you can have a smart, intelligent conversation with your friend about the Scottish referendum or whatever it might be. Um, and the moment that sort of um, someone comes up next to you and they've got a cute little dog or a cat or whatever, and you reach down and stroke the animal, you're not suddenly an idiot. The moment that you exchange a joke, you don't suddenly become a fool. You don't become a separate person. Uh, if anything, you've just kind of proved your humanity. Um, this is uh, something that advertising and, and comms has always, I think, missed the point on. Uh, and even if, as a publisher, from a media perspective, you feel that your content exists in this walled garden of, of perfection and uh, smartness, or even, allegedly, uh, even um, you think that you're all about entertainment, uh, the reality is most people are finding your content mixed in with all these other things. Uh, you might have the New York Times down here, uh, but you're going to have your friend sharing the kind of BuzzFeed post up here. We, as BuzzFeed, might have our smart news about um, guns found tonight by police in Ferguson up here, which we're really proud of, uh, but it's going to be immediately next to Vice saying cuddle parties are rubbish even when you're on MDMA. Um, like, we can't stop people from finding our content like that. This is the new reality. Um, and I think you see it across the whole landscape now. So everyone's catching up. Uh, the Guardian know that they can write about Snowden and simultaneously have uh, sort of lifestyle content, um, uh, entertainment content, engage with the consumers, adapt to the new uh, culture of the web. Uh, and finally, um, in the, the world of advertising, uh, we think, so we're, we're well known for creating really shareable content, um, but the second part that we're, we're quite well known for is our uh, monetization strategy. So we think that monetizing with banner ads, with push marketing, with kind of put your logo here is a very, very weak proposition. It's not compelling for marketers and it's not um, a good business strategy for publishers. Uh, this is a, an article from the Wall Street Journal. Marketers seek a banner blindness cure. Pity the poor banner ad. Cutting edge just a few years ago, this pioneer of web advertising is now scorned as hopelessly out of date, a neglected stepchild in an era of web video widgets, mashups, and social networking. This article was written seven years ago. Seven years ago, the Wall Street Journal was saying that banners don't work. Push marketing, the days of like just repeating a message a billion times, are coming to an end. And they don't just not work for advertisers, they don't really work for publishers either. So um, the amount of money that you could make, this is a comparison of what you could, how you can monetize a thousand people. The amount of money you can make from a thousand people looking at a newspaper is quite good, it's about 50 bucks. So build good scale and you can do some really cool stuff. Uh, in desktop, it's, it's a lot smaller, but, but maybe you could cling on to the reality that if you made enough cuts, you could still do cool stuff with this. Um, but the problem is pretty much all publishers are now mobile companies. And there's just not much money you can make just from offering access to audience, just from saying, put your logo here. You need to do more for advertisers. Uh, so at BuzzFeed, um, uh, we partner with brands. We say, how can we tell your story in an interesting way? How can we make it good enough that consumers are going to look at it? They're going to know it's from a brand, um, but they're still going to enjoy it, and they're going to choose to share it with their friends. Um, I know that there are some people from Heineken here. Uh, so uh, this is a post that we did for them. Uh, I think it was secret signals that all good mates should know. Uh, so Heineken wants to be associated with Australianness, with mateship, with good times, with all those sorts of feelings. Um, so we create posts like this, uh, secret signals that, that mates should know. Uh, uh, sorry, hold on. Yeah. Your ex is here, don't look. Um, and we host it on a page, and the Foster's logo's there, the, uh, their Facebook feed's there, their Twitter feed's there, all this sort of stuff, but it doesn't feel like a hard sell. It doesn't feel like um, they're just trying to flog you beer. It feels like they're trying to tell you an interesting story that also happens to communicate who they are and, um, and, and what their brand is about. So uh, just finally, um, like I said, we're investing in video a lot. Uh, we're doing more and more branded video as well. Um, I've got two branded videos I can show you. One's about cats, uh, one's about dogs. Uh, who likes cats more? Okay, who likes dogs more? Okay, um, I like cats more and I've got the clicker, so we're gonna watch the one about cats. Um, Despite okay. being huge and having the ability to open canned goods, humans are frail in both body and mind, and we must care for them. Perhaps from ennui or malaise, humans often stare at random inanimate objects for hours at a time. Your duty is to break this spell, to remind them that there is life out there to live. Perhaps the worst offender of these objects is the light box. You must remind them that boxes don't need light. You just need the light of your imagination. See what I did there? Look, I'm an astronaut now. And now I'm a rocket ship and the box is the astronaut. I just blew your mind. They insist on using water bowls that are too narrow for their heads. 
which means they cannot drink in the civilized fashion, with your face and your tongue. Speaking of tongues, humans don't seem to use theirs for anything. You must lick them every morning and remind them that a tongue is a terrible thing to waste. I have no clue how they keep clean. Besides that cute little tuft on their heads, humans are, for the most part, sadly, hairless. During the day, they cover themselves with little body blankets. You must donate your fur to these articles whenever possible. Each night, you must curl up on their faces, or they will freeze to death. For all of this, we only ask the occasional help opening cans and a clean place to do our kitty business. But even here, they need help too. They're constantly bringing in these giant bags they can barely carry. Remind them there is an alternative. All the strength, half the weight. Clever human. So, in summary... Um, oh, that was the dog one. Uh, we are in the age of social. Uh, the, the web is all about social now. Um, uh, most people wake up every morning, they look at their phones, they look at Facebook, they look at Twitter, they're not looking at these uh, publisher sites, they're probably not, almost certainly not looking at the microsites that marketers might choose to set up. Um, homepages aren't what they are, uh, destinations don't really count, um, but ultimately if we can create really compelling content, if we can come up with interesting, exciting things that consumers enjoy and enjoy so much they're going to share it with their friends, um, uh, we might just have some success. Thank you. Thank you so much, Will.